Sex can't be intimate if you feel like you don't matter. That comes from a great book called The Great Sex Rescue, where I got the title of this podcast and the next. Listen, we're jumping over Movement 4 for now, and here's why. Movement 5 is parallel to Movement 3. Remember in the, in the poetic structure of the Song of Songs? It's brilliant poetry. But we get to see an aspect of the queen that she can no longer keep hidden. When the king groom finds her, she cannot be vulnerable. Uh, and she'll open up in, in movement four, but right now she can't be loved. She can't love back. She can't have great sex. She, she can have intercourse, right? Sure. But not the intimacy and closeness and honor and trust that she's longing for. The watchman on the wall will not let her. The lattice won't let her. Okay? And we should be able to relate to her. Uh, you can give her a book to read about intimacy, about sex. You can send her to counseling or to a conference, and that might help. But she needs a transforming power in her midbrain that rewires all of the wounds there. And here's the point. This is where the king's love finds her and finds all of us every day. We're so shredded emotionally and relationally, we just can't get there. We're just making do relationally and intimately at best until the king. Bottom line, man, woman, do you want great sex? Do you want intimacy, not just intercourse? Check it out. In this movement, and in particular, Movement 4, which we'll see in a couple of podcasts, we're going to show you how to get there. No shame, no working harder. That's just not the core problem. You may be surprised. You need healing. And make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks ahead of time. It is very helpful. This may encourage someone to check out this particular show. And then you'll be a co-conspirator with us about getting the word out about God's love for the unlovable, the unloved, and the unlovely. Thanks ahead of time. Welcome to God's love for the unlovable. Welcome back. We're going to shift to movement five. I slept, the queen says, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. All right, movement three that we've been looking at, and now movement five, they're dark nights of the soul for the queen. Nightmarish, Dark, fierce, shadowy, murky, uh, but you know, it's her. It's her just being exposed. If I were to put it to music, I'd make it the blues or tragic, heavy metal or emo, maybe. Movement five is juxtaposed against the ending of one of the most wonderful love poems ever penned. Movement four, we'll look at it. And uh, immediately after that intimacy comes the darkest of the poems of the collection, like movement three. Movement five is a nightmarish scene. It's disturbing, kind of Stephen King-esque in a way. The movement begins with the great lover king coming to be completely with her, to love her. Now, this is what she's dreamed of in earlier sections. This is what she fantasizes over, her husband's love for her as she is. She's longed for it, right? So now he comes. And she smashes him. She rebuffs his advances. She acts out. Now, I suspect that she has relational PTSD. I think that's accurate. And perhaps it's deeply unconscious fear that he's going to abandon her like everyone else has or abuse her. So she rejects him ahead of time. Right? Let's get the first blow in. Are there fears of being loved? Yeah. Re being rejected? Yeah. It's a history there. Uh, she's been drugged into other relationships that have hurt her. Yes. Either way, all of those things might be true, but it's an act of insanity, really. It's not reasonable. And it is tragic self-absorption. Not intentional. It's just subconscious. It's not evil. I think we should all be able to relate. In my 30 years of pastoring and pastoring counseling, I see this a lot. I see it a lot in the mirror, you know? And so she says to the king, not tonight, I have a headache. 
And by the way, this coming of the king, I think, is also uh, the part of the marriage process. If you remember in Jewish uh, uh, culture, the marriage process was twofold. First, there was the betrothal. The groom and the bride's father would meet, negotiate the bride price, the marriage price, the dowry. The bride and the groom would then drink the first cup. At that moment, I'll say more about this when we get to movement four. At that moment, they're legally married, husband and wife. Uh, but then something else has to happen. The groom then leaves, goes to his father's house, and begins to prepare uh, the home for his new bride. He needs a job, he needs an income, he needs a home, it all needs to be fixed up. Until then, they lived separately, still husband and wife, right? You can't date anybody else, but you, you're living separately. And I think that's where the scene begins, right? Can you imagine all of that? It's so different. Well, when the groom's father agrees that he's prepared to be a husband to this new wife, maybe often a year or more, after the betrothal, he comes for her. This is the great groom procession. And I'm going to say more about that in movement number four. We actually see it. But her job is to be ready and prepared for the procession, for the marriage ceremony. So if that's this, what we're seeing now, when the king comes for her after a year or so of waiting, longing to be with her, wanting to make her physically his bride, well, that makes this movement even more tragic. She's not ready. And in any way, she's not ready. She shuts him down. She turns him away. She slams the door on him. This would have been a huge cultural spit in the husband's face. So I'm guessing this would have been ground for divorce in, in some minds in that culture. So imagine, what would you think he might do? This is public. Uh, let me take you on a little important rabbit trail. Today in the church, <clears throat> there's an often ugly debate between two theological extremes of Christians loved by God, complementarianism and egalitarianism. You know, I cringe at some of the nasty emotional rhetoric that's tossed back and forth. And, and it's true in a lot of, of theological debates, scripture is used as a bludgeon to make points and to damage the points of views of others. It gets heated, you know what I'm saying? There are also lots of historic wounds uh, between, of fighting between the two camps, still gaping and bleeding. Uh, there's women who, who were told historically to submit to their husbands, even if they were abusive, as, because that was their spiritual duty in Christ, and they could point to a verse Neither side should ever embrace such destructive, unchristlike crap. My problem, though, with the debate is that they are unduly focused upon only one aspect of the theological issue of, of gender and sexes and sex roles. They're almost always fighting over authority or headship uh, or submission, right? That four letter word. See, the idea is, if you listen to the rhetoric, is that one group, one gender, has the power and the right to make the other gender do something maybe they don't want to do. No one would ever say it that way. But that's the way it feels right under the surface. Here's one complementarian view of marriage. I'm going to try to be fair to both sides. I think both sides have much to offer the debate. I think they've just gotten stuck in this fistfight over authority. I'll, I'll say what I think the real dialogue should be about in a second. All right, so here is the one definition, a complementarian definition of marriage. The husband and wife are of equal worth before God since both are created in God's image. The marriage relationship models the way God relates to his people. A husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He has the God-given responsibility to provide for, to protect, and to lead his family. A wife is to submit herself graciously to the servant leadership of her husband, even as the church willingly submits to the headship of Christ. Uh, okay, well, um, let me make a few comments. Again, I'm going to try to be fair here, but just track me. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. I'm a bit troubled by the putting love to the church in past tense. I'm not quite sure what that even means, but uh, okay, I'm not going to nitpick. So first, there has only been one male who has ever loved his wife as Christ loves the church. That was Adam, and that was Adam pre-fall. None of us have. We, we should, 
<laughs> we really should, but we don't. We won't. Humanly speaking, we, we just can't. Uh, we should. That's the command. Don't get me wrong. Our brains are so shredded and beat up and loaded with such, such self-focused and self-protective inner working models from infancy. There's a part of our brain that just doesn't want to do this. It means that we're just not willing to sacrifice everything all of the time for her, right, our spouse's, our wife's well-being. Well, you know, I'm sure, man, that you've Got that same kickback. Maybe you've tried that before. I mean, you went to a conference and you're going, I'm going to be sacrificial. I'm going to do it and do it and do it and do it. And your beat up wife, who's emotionally beat up, shredded you or abused you or, or wasn't responsive or wasn't grateful. And, and the triggers started happening again. So, right, right? So your subconscious has, been, has set up powerful boundaries that fight against you choosing to be ultimately sacrificial. Right? All right, let's keep going. A wife is to submit herself graciously. By the way, not out of compulsion or shaming or because it's the law. This is a whole new level of submission. It's a gracious, willing submission. Uh, no credit uh, for a letter of the law if you don't do it graciously. And to, to submit to the servant leadership of her husband. Even as the church willingly submits to the headship of Christ. There's so much here, I don't know where to start. First, look at the history of the church. Just how willing have we really been to submit to the headship of Christ? Let me mention a few things. Crusades, slavery, supporting patriarchalism way too often at, at the detriment of, 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 of women. See, we're not good at this. That's what I'm saying. And women, how many of you have been bludgeoned with the bat labeled submit to your male partner because Jesus said to, even if he's abusing you? So your brain... This is how God designed it. It's just going to put up very entrenched boundaries to protect you from getting hurt like that. Again, you're going to be a bit paranoid. It's not all your fault, meaning that you will struggle to graciously submit to anyone. It hurt you so much the last time. You see, these are two wounded people trying to, trying to do the right thing, and I'm, I'm suggesting that our brains are going to work against it 100% of the time. So I'm suggesting that the gender issue and the sex issue is less about control and submission and authority and headship, and it's more about our mutual brokenness that conflicts with one another and our need for healing. And then we look to each other for healing, and you can see how that gets into a cycle, right? This is where counselors make their money. We're not working out the sexual identity thing until there has been healing in all of us. Um, the scars, the burnt emotions, the betrayals, the paranoia, the fears, the insecurities, both men and women. And so the great sex rescue book says, can't, sex can't be intimate if you feel like you don't matter. Totally right. And none of us really feel like we matter. That comes from God. That's all we're about here at, at uh, Gospel App, about uh, God's love for the unlovable. Sex cannot be intimate if you are afraid of being hurt, afraid of being used, or being betrayed, or being seen as a failure. It's only intercourse. And all of that has been set up by interworking models that were formed when you were one year old. So let's look at an egalitarian definition as well, just to be fair or mutually abusive, equally abusive, right? So one definition defines marriage as a co-partnership, of equality, where neither may lord it over the other. This represents an egalitarian view of marriage. Egalitarian marriages are described as mutual partnerships without forced roles and characterized by a high degree of intimacy. Well, great. But again, there are two wounded, insecure, needy, misled, afraid, beat up, lonely, afraid of failing, afraid of rejection, afraid of being hurt again, abandoned again, blamed again, men and women. It's not about roles as much or forced roles as much as it is. It's about my brokenness, anxieties and fears, my sense of loneliness. We, humanly speaking, can't love or be loved. It's brain science. Are you following me? So we need ongoing healing. We need to experience security. We need trust. We need to be trusted. We need a remedy for my fear. So when the great lover king finds me, we can't do 
either complementarianism or egalitarianism very well. We're too fearful. We're too needy. Look, push back. I imagine that I upset somebody. I triggered someone or something. You're trying to put me in one of those camps, right? I mean, I have theological views on the topic. I just think we're both, with that, the rhetoric that's in there, I think we're missing the point. So, so email, dialogue, bill at gospel-app.com. I'd love to talk to you. So that's the desperate need of his transforming love. Remember the simple uncluttered gospel. And I'm not kidding just how effective it works. But it takes time. It takes repetition. Uh, two times a day for 45 days minimum. Right? Say it aloud, word for word. The gospel that it represents to your shredded midbrain is powerful to begin healing. Not perfect this side of heaven, but it should be noticeable. So many people start saying it a couple of times, maybe a week, and then they stop. You know, their PFC says, their prefrontal cortex says, I got it. I don't have that problem anymore. I understand. But it's not the prefrontal cortex we're trying to reach. It's that murky, hidden behind walls, midbrain. Please, I'm begging you, keep it up two times a day. Note changes. Note pe how people have observed you've changed. Say it aloud for 45 days, word for word, and let us know. Movement five is a great poetic image of the problem. So let's keep going. For you comps and egals who are offended, again, please stay with me. I think movement five is portraying the real issues and the real remedy, maybe a third way. Uh, so push back, bill at gospel-app.com. All right, back to the movement. The queen says, the restless nights are back. But listen, oh my heart, can't you hear it? My lover is knocking on my door. The king says, again, revelation. Open to me, my best friend, my darling, my gentle one, my flawless one. I've made special effort to be with you tonight. And I suggest that she's not egalitarian or complementarian. I think she's self-focused. I think she's wounded. I think she's hurt. I think she's crying out for help. And her brain's kicked into reactionary dysregulation. The king coming and his desire for her, out of his love for her, triggers something self-focused. It should cause her to feel loved. It should cause her to feel safe and trusted with this love of the king. But it doesn't. We should all be able to relate, and it's not all her fault. No shaming here. But at the moment, she can't. Honestly, with integrity, choose to love the king back. She's riddled with too many fears. The poet gives us a great, honest view of her heart. She is not faking her reactionary behavior, her emotional dysregulation. It, it is what it is. She is who she is. Verse 3, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? Oh, my goodness, what a slap down. And here's my interpretation. Resentment and anger, among other emotions, flushed out of my heart as I heard those words. Who are you that I should change my evening plans? Can't you see that I'm already in bed? I've already taken my clothes and makeup off. Do you know how much effort it is to get presentable again? I've already bathed. Are you expecting me to jump every time you say jump? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So her brain has betrayed her or is protecting her or both. She wants to be with the king. She wants to be loved by him. It's just that love has hurt her so much. Lectures and sermons on being a gracious partner or being an equal partner just aren't going to help her, right? It's not her problem. She's got issues. And it's not about her prefrontal cortex where things are reasonable and rational, in which you go, hmm, yeah, I should do that. No, it's about her wounded protective midbrain. We all have one. Are you following me? Hey, what a guy. He doesn't force himself. He, does, he honors her choices. This is what the lover does. She is treated with the dignity afforded a great queen, even though she's not acting like one. There's no sign of him getting frustrated or angry or resentful or blaming or needing an apology, a perfect apology, whatever that is, right? All the games we typically play. There is no sign, as we'll see, that this counts against her ever. His love for her is still sound. It's not diminished whatsoever. He loves her. And so he leaves his mark of his continuing desire for her. 
This isn't egalitarian or complementarian. This is a view of love higher than our categories, right? We can't do either until healing happens. Healing happens in his arms, in his gaze. You can't just choose to submit or to be gracious. We don't have those muscle groups. So back to movement five, watch how the poet portrays it so brilliantly. Verse three, here's the queen. I watched for my lover's response as he put his hand through the lattice door opening. Something happened deep inside of me. I felt a rush of intense desire for him. I got up, ran to the door. The handle was dripping with his perfume. I urgently opened the door to call to him. But he had already departed. He was gone. My heart sank like an anchor in my soul. What have I done? I frantically ran to the city to look for him. I called out his name again and again, but there was no answer. Whew. So not tonight. Right, that reactionary behavior quickly shifts to, OMG, what have I done again? Well, the problem is she opens the door and he's nowhere in sight. Right? So she's feeling shame and guilt and fear of rejection, fear that she's given him a reason to reject her. She's messed up. You know, what, what's wrong with me? What am I thinking? Why am I such an idiot? I must be more deeply broken than I ever feared. Right? And I've given him reason to not love me. Emotions in the mix, well, deep regret, self-criticism, paranoia, shame, guilt, failure, despair, depression, self-pity, anxiety, fear. She's riddled with sorrow. But we suspect that it's only self-focused, worldly sorrow, not repentance. Well, you're not hearing repentance in all of this, right? It's too self-focused to be real biblical repentance. Repentance is other-directed. I've hurt you. <laughs> There's none of that. She can only be self-absorbed still. Again, not for long. Uh, movement seven. <laughs> She's a mess. Driven by a mixed bag of emotions, she once again tragically runs back to the city. <laughs> she has to do something. I get it. Anything to get rid of those oppressive emotions and feelings to find relief. Remember the DACC in your brain? So she runs to her place of addiction uh, where she can find some soothing, the city. Red alert. The city allows for such venting. It loves people like that. And it's the most natural place to be a victim because there's other victims around. Everybody's playing the victim card. They make you feel better, right? It listens to hurt and wounded. Oh, you poor dear, come here. Sit here a while. Let's have a drink. You know, everything will be all right. But the city has no power to heal. It has no power to get rid of shame and guilt. There are diversions. There's medications. There's compassion, listening, ears. But they don't offer any challenges, no judgment. Lulled to sleep in the city, ah, she can't be in the garden. She would never, ever feel comfortable in the garden in this state of being a victim. Yeah? Verse 7, the queen says, The watchmen found me as they made their rounds of the city. Oh, my goodness, here they are again. This time they don't pass by her. They beat me up, she says, stripped me bare and left me naked and bleeding on the cold stone pavement alone. Oh, those watchmen on the walls. Well, the nature and role of the watchmen, you know, we mentioned it in, in Movement 3. They're very obscure. Normally, in the ancient world, the watchmen were to be agents of the king, uh, right? The or city leadership, they were meant to be protection and security. But in Movement 3, they were indifferent. They were strangers to love, strangers to the king. And here... They actually abuse the queen. This seems horrific. It's repulsive. It's frightening. She is left on the ground, fully exposed, naked. She's become a public spectacle for everyone in the city to see. And remember, I said that she can't be intimate. She can't submit graciously until changes are made inside of her head. Uh, right? And I think part of that is the watchman on the walls in her head. And until she's exposed... She is just, she will get emotionally beat up any and every time that she tries to be intimate. Being close exposes this. And those watchmen in her brain can be very bloody. And eventually she can grow numb. Uh, she can develop an uh, intimacy PTSD where it doesn't hurt as much or she can self-medicate. Right? Uh, anybody know what I mean? 
<laughs> right? And if so, give me your testimony, bill at gospel-app.com. Put it into your words for me. That could help somebody. Please do. If you could relate to this queen right now, please give me a paragraph, bill at gospel-app.com. Yeah? So women, check out this simple, uncluttered gospel that I'm preparing just for you. Uh, men, you can get the, the usual one, Simple and Cluttered Gospel, for you at our website. But this is one for the ladies. Ladies, say it twice a day for 45 days. We're preaching the gospel of the king, groom, to your dark and murky, largely subconscious midbrain, where that nasty critical inner voice resides. Don't think that because you know the gospel that it is getting into that subconscious region. That takes intentional and concerted effort day after day. So say it twice a day allowed for 45 days, write down changes. And, and by the way, give me a report. What's going on daily if you want? Bill at gospel-app.com. So here it is. Just sit back and listen. Jesus follower, daughter of the Most High, strictly because of what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago, God actually loves you. He loves you with all of his heart. As much as the Father loves the Son and the Spirit and the Son and the Spirit loves the Father, he can't love you anymore or any less than he does right now. He can't love you more if you were smarter, funnier, had better career, were more educated, had more authority, were a better boss, employee, friend, lover, mother, daughter, married, divorced, widowed, single, more attractive, weighed more, had better hair, were a better cook. He loves you the same no matter what you've done or what's been done to you. You can't add to this love or take away from it. Just stop trying. This is the love that your brain has subconsciously been chosen for for so long. Now I get it. It often feels like you've messed it up or need to do something more so that God would like you better. Not so. It's brain science. Nothing has hurt you more than relationships that have gone badly. God designed your brain to protect you from getting hurt again, but that is also causing you to subconsciously resist loving and being loved. Your only fix is to access the God-sourced power through the Spirit in your inner being so that you can begin to experience the height and width and length and depth of the love of Christ for you and for others. How do you start to experience this incongruous love for you more now? Simple, good news, there is something that you can do, you're invited to do. You can take daily baby steps to ask the Spirit inside of you to make you know, experience, and feel just how much God loves you right now. Not help you, make you know that. Ask again later today, ask tomorrow, right? Twice a day, 45 days. Make it a spiritual habit. Then dance, daughter of the Most High Dance. So let us know if you're getting it. We love hearing from people. Bill at gospel-app.com. And do us a favor and help us get the word out about the love of God for the unlovable, the unlovely, and the unloved. First, subscribe. <laughs> it's not that much effort. If this was beneficial to you, please subscribe to our channel. That will encourage others to do the same. And thanks ahead of time. As I mentioned, I'm taking a short break, very short, from writing my book on the Song of Songs and, and writing a book on overlooked biblical women of the Old Testament. Lots of fun, eye-opening. You know, if you want to be on the mailing list to know when it comes out so you can be, get one of the first copies, let me know. I'm about halfway through. Bill at gospel-app.com. Take heart, child of God.